Well, thank you very much. And I would like to uh, thank Anders Carlson, um, who uh, nominated me and the, the faculty of the uh, Department of Plant Breeding at Alnarp for, uh, for the nomination for this uh, very uh, prestigious honor that I'm very grateful to have received. Thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about work that we do at the University of Nebraska, and probably the first question is, where is Nebraska? And uh, <laughs> it's in the, uh, the central part of the United States, uh, in the western part of the uh, grain, major grain production region of the United States. And uh, our economy is strongly based on agriculture, and um, probably some of the challenges, many of the challenges that we face with agricultural production in Nebraska are similar to those that you face in, in Sweden. And I'm going to tell you about uh, some projects that uh, have involved uh, collaborations with uh, Swedish researchers, including uh, researchers at SLU at, in Alnarp. Uh, one is through the uh, ICON project that was led by uh, Professor Sten Stemney, and uh, also uh, more recently work that we do with the Oil uh, Crops for the Future uh, program uh, that is also uh, a collaboration with Loon University and SLU, and this is led by Rodomiro Ortiz. But I'm going to tell you about work that we do with Krister Lofsted's lab in the uh, area of um, novel ways to uh, e effect uh, insect control in crops. And also I'm going to mention some collaborations that we have with uh, Roth Hampstead Research in the UK and the uh, lab of Jonathan Napier in trying to uh, produce high value aquaculture feed and crops. And uh, also the uh, people from my laboratory at the University of Nebraska who have contributed to this and my colleague, uh, my faculty colleague, Tom Clemente at, at UNL who has uh, helped with this research. Okay, so I think we're all aware that one of the, the, probably the major challenge that we face in agricultural production is the expanding world population that uh, is expected to reach, you know, over nine billion by 2050, uh, you know, so we worry about this, yet we have done very well with uh, capturing genetic diversity through breeding and also bringing in genetic diversity from uh, other sources through biotechnology. And this is the uh, example of maize where there's been a, a steep rise in the uh, uh, yield per acre over time. And, uh, and this, again, is largely due to bringing in genetic diversity that exists within maize, but also bringing in genetic diversity through biotechnology. The concern is that uh, perhaps these genetic gains, the yield gains, are, you know, will begin to plateau, and that maybe we need to think about other ways to uh, keep this traje trajectory going to meet the needs of the expanding world population. But at the same time, uh, agricultural production, particularly with the commodity crops, has uh, become so efficient that uh, very few people are needed to produce crops. And this has uh, really caused you know, issues with the rural economy, that very few people are needed in the rural areas. And so uh, you know, part of this challenge to meeting the, uh, the need to uh, feed the world population is also keeping farmers profitable and keeping rural economies vibrant. And uh, so the work that we do in biotechnology and oilseed biotechnology, it may be a dream, but our, our ultimate goal is to produce higher value crops that uh, can uh, promote these economies. Okay, so uh, this is an example uh, of the maize prices, that historic prices since uh, 1981. And in red is the uh, adjusted price per metric ton of uh, maize adjusted for inflation. And you can see that there have been great years for the farmers where they've made a lot of money, but more recently we're approaching historic lows in the uh, prices that the farmers receive for these commodity crops. And uh, just as of Monday, the, uh, the price of corn on the world market was $138 per metric ton, and that's really, at this point, that's almost at a historic low over the last uh, 25 or so years. And so what we're looking at here is uh, ways to maybe uh, increase the value of crops, uh, maybe not uh, on a large scale, but on a, a more smaller scale to help the uh, rural economies. Okay, so, uh, okay, so the, uh, the dream of these projects like ICON and uh, the oil crops for the future is really to create uh, higher, more value in crops using uh, biotechnology, but uh, the, the idea is maybe to uh, buffer this boom and bust that we see in the uh, prices of the commodity crops. 
and also maybe create uh, rural processing industries where you can bring jobs to the rural areas, promote the economies, and uh, also uh, promote environmental sustainability. And I'll tell you a couple of examples of how we're trying to do this. And uh, th this is not uh, drawn to scale, okay? So actually Sweden is about two, time, two and a half times larger than the state of Nebraska, so <laughs> I don't mean to. <laughs> <laughs> make your country look small. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, but the idea is that, uh, you know, so we grow crops throughout Nebraska. Our economy is, you know, um, is very uh, highly based on agricultural production. And uh, as with the low corn prices, our tax receipts are quite low right now. We're going through budget cuts in the state. And this is very similar throughout the Midwest of the United States. And so the idea is that maybe we can create higher value in existing crops or new, new types of uh, oil seeds and maybe grow them on smaller acreage but have high value to uh, promote the uh, rural economies. And so maybe it would be just these uh, red areas in the rural areas where uh, we have producing maybe 1,000, 10,000 acres of uh, some specialty uh, crop that then can be processed in the rural area to create jobs. And this is an example in, in Nebraska of what a small town looks like in the rural area where uh, all you have is a, a grain elevator that's uh, on the railroad track, uh, a small bar, and uh, a few churches. And that's about the uh, extent of uh, the small communities. And we would like to have uh, factories and so forth that are uh, processing these agricultural products. Okay, so the work that we do are, uh, I'm going to tell you about work that we do with uh, a, an oil seed crop called Camelina, Camelina sativa. Uh, so this is a, a, a developing oil seed crop in the brassica family uh, that we love it because uh, as biotechnologists, it's easy to introduce genes through uh, the agrobacterium type of method using procedures that are very similar to the model species of Arabidopsis and uh, has a very short life cycle that it can be fit into rotations with other crops. And uh, it's a non-food uh, crop in the United States. And so we see this as a potential platform for producing maybe industrial traits that won't be uh, integrated into the food stream, that these can be segregated. Also, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about research that we do with soybean, which is uh, probably the, the second major crop in the state of Nebraska, and then the second major crop in the United States our number one oil seed crop, uh, but it's, so it's readily uh, transformable. We can introduce genes into it. It's an established crop. And the work that we're doing with this is uh, to introduce aquaculture and livestock feed traits that may bring value. I'll tell you at the end a little bit about work that we're doing with maize. Maize is not maize roots in particular, and maize roots are not oil seeds, but uh, what we uh, learn from these other crops can be used for improving uh, maize uh, production, and our focus with this is with the uh, root exudates and microbiome. Okay, so Camelina, we call it a, a designer biotech oil seed crop, again, because we can transform it very easily. And uh, we have vector systems that we spend quite a bit of time developing where we can introduce multiple genes, many genes at one time, and uh, try to affect uh, large changes uh, in the uh, the oil production and other traits that are in, in Camelina. And, uh, and I, I will tell you that, you know, even though we think this is a wonderful crop, it's not really been subjected to extensive breeding, and so it still has problems. And I'll tell you about a little bit about synthetic biology approaches to address some of these problems that uh, have arisen because of the lack of breeding traits like small seed size, heat sensitivity, and poor oil quality. Okay, so uh, in Nebraska, we are not at all adverse to uh, biotechnology. We, we embrace it, the farmers embrace it, because they see it as a way to uh, improve their profit. And uh, so in the state of, in the University of Nebraska, we have uh, extensive numbers of farms throughout the state, but we have two dedicated uh, biotech field facilities, one in the uh, eastern part of the state where Lincoln, Nebraska is, our university, where there's larger rainfall, but in the western part of the state, where it's under dry land conditions, we have another biotech field site. And we call Nebraska a living laboratory for studying water relations in plants because of this large uh, gradient of uh, precipitation of rainfall across the state. And so we uh, have conducted uh, biotech field trials for many years now with Camelina. We, we do it 
quite extensively with soybean for probably the last 15 years. And uh, so we have developed what we think is a sort of a biotech pipeline where we make uh, discoveries in the lab, translate them to the greenhouse, and ultimately test them in the field, and then combine this with downstream processing technologies to uh, see whether uh, what we've produced in the field really has any value for processing. Okay, so this is an example of, uh, of maize, of a commodity crop, and how you gain value by using every component of the seed. Okay, so uh, with maize, you know, you have starch and protein, some oil in the, uh, in the embryo, and uh, these are easily separated, and uh, there's markets for all of these uh, components of the seed, and so these are commodity markets, and the margins that the farmer, you know, that the producers would get for each of these uh, components is small, but when you add them all up, it creates value, and this is the value that ultimately is translated back to the farmer and the price of the, the crop. Okay, so we have the same ideas with uh, trying to create new biotech oil seeds, but our, what we want to do differently, though, is focus on traits that have high value and try to stack as many traits as possible, high value traits, into one seed. And so maybe we're uh, looking at producing high value oils, but also combining them with high value proteins and other uh, minor components that can be easily separated, perhaps uh, in a rural uh, environment. And this is uh, obtained, I've got this from Crystal Lofsted. It's a pyramid showing the value of the different components of uh, agricultural production. We focus a lot on bioenergy with crops, and that's actually at the lowest point of the value chain. Also, we have done work with lubricants, which is also low value. But if you want to create the high value, you go to these other areas, maybe bioplastics, uh, some niche markets for food and feed, and also biopharma is uh, probably at the top of the pyramid for uh, the value chain. Okay, so, so with oil seeds, uh, we have a platform. Okay, so we have photosynthetic carbon that's fixed and created and put into these uh, hydrocarbon chains known as fatty acids. And we know a lot about the genetics and the biochemistry of modifying a fatty acid chain to, you know, to add more value to it. We know about enzymes like fatty acid desaturases that can add double bonds or unsaturation to a fatty acid. We know about the enzymatic systems and the genes underlying creating longer hydrocarbon chains, making modifications like hydroxylation that you find in castor bean oil, for example, that uh, add value to the, uh, the, the hydrocarbon, the carbon chain. And so we can uh, capture this genetic diversity from uh, different species, from different organisms to modify uh, hydrocarbon, the fatty acid chains, to create higher value. We also are interested in the isoprenoid pathway that produces molecules like carotenoids and vitamin E to copperols, and how this can be tapped into to uh, also create value, higher value of the oil seed. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of, of examples of higher value things that we're working on. So one in, that we do in collaboration with Jonathan Napier at Roth Hampstead is uh, to tr create a uh, land-based source of aquaculture feed using camelina and soybean as a platform. Okay, so with aquaculture, the uh, fish oils, the fatty acids that we like to eat that we think are high, good for our, our heart, the EPA, the DHA, these are not produced by the fish they get them from their diet, and so uh, what happens now is that, that, that uh, we farm, the, we uh, mine the oceans for low-value fish, we extract uh, fish oil from these lower-value fish, we extract fish meal from these low-value fish, and then feed it in these uh, aquaculture systems to the higher-value fish. And, some, and so these fish are not able to make their own EPA, DHA, they uh, can't make uh, their, their proteins, they get it from their diet through the protein of uh, the fish meal. And so this, some people consider this to be a non-sustainable system where we are mining the oceans for uh, low-value fish to feed to these higher-value uh, fish in the aquaculture system. We are also interested in uh, astaxanthin. This is the carotenoid pigment that gives the color to the uh, salmon, for example. And this is a uh, so the salmon are not able to produce their own carotenoid pigment. They have to get it again from their diet, from eating the plankton, the microbes that are in the, uh, the water that, give, uh, that have this pigment in these organisms that uh, add the color. 
And this is actually one of the uh, more expensive components of the uh, aquaculture feed with estimates that this is uh, of a value of about 2,500 uh, US dollars per kilogram. And this would put you higher on the, uh, this value pyramid than focusing on uh, lower value traits like biofuels, for example. Okay, so we're, what we're trying to do with cameline and soybean is create a land-based sustainable source of uh, the fish meal, the fish oils, and the astaxanthin. Okay, so uh, we're, we're, we know a lot about uh, isoprenoid path, the isoprenoid pathway, about making carotenoids. And so we've taken genes from the Adonis flower. The Adonis flower, the petals are very rich in the astaxanthin pigment. Okay, so we've uh, identified uh, the genes. Others have identified the genes in Adonis. And we have taken these and introduced them under seed-specific promoters and uh, have been able to produce camelina and soybean that have the, the red color that from astaxanthin. They look uh, very beautiful. And <laughs> okay, so uh, this has been successful. And uh, so we've, uh, this, this is an example of uh, camelina. We've introduced the genes to, uh, the three genes to produce uh, astaxanthin into camelina. And uh, we see some problems initially with uh, chlorotic, uh, chlorotic uh, cotyledons, but the plants grow out of this and uh, the yields have been comparable to wild type, and we've grown these in the field for the last uh, three years without any uh, noticeable problems. Okay, so we are also working with Jonathan Napier's lab, who has taken genes from uh, various microbes that produce EPA and DHA. So uh, camelin and soybean don't produce their own EPA and DHA. You have to take genes from these other sources, non-plant sources, that can elongate the fatty acid chain from 18 carbons to 20, introduce uh, up to five double bonds to make EPA, six double bonds to make DHA. And so we've taken our astaxanthin camelina and crossed it with the uh, EPA and DHA camelina that the Napier lab has produced. And uh, so we now have uh, EPA, DHA camelina, astaxanthin camelina that we uh, have grown in the field this year in uh, Nebraska, and it seemed to have done okay. Okay, so we're also working on this with uh, soybean, and in this case, uh, this can be, I guess, considered to be synthetic biology because we uh, synthesized a large component of a, a gene cluster and uh, put many genes, I think this is uh, up to eight or nine genes that we put together at one time, introduced these all at one time into soybean to uh, try to affect a change. Originally, we had done this, ind put individual genes in, and we spent many years crossing the soybeans, but by synthesizing these large pieces of DNA, we can affect these changes in one uh, transformation experiment. And so we have uh, soybeans that are producing up to 13% EPA. We've also introduced a gene for vitamin E antioxidants to stabilize the uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, and that's been quite effective. And we can produce these red soybeans that are enriched in astaxanthin and its precursor, donaxanthin, that are probably at economically relevant levels. Okay, so I'm going to change gears just a little bit. I mean, we've been working through the uh, Oil Crops for the Future program uh, with Krister Lovsted and uh, colleagues at, uh, at the uh, SLU and ONARP to uh, generate camelina that, are, that can make the precursors for insect sex pheromones. Okay, so these sex pheromones are important for attracting uh, the male uh, insects, and, uh, but they can be used in an insecticidal way. So we now spray these uh, chemical insecticides, but we can also use these insect sex pheromones at very small concentrations and uh, trap the, uh, the male uh, uh, insect pests and uh, reduce the uh, infiltration of uh, these insects into uh, the crops. And in particular, we're working with the, uh, a type of uh, sex pheromone that's derived from uh, fatty acids. These are what are known as 16-1, Z11 aldehyde, Z11-16-1 acetate, and a little bit of the alcohol form. And again, these are derived from fatty acids, and uh, they are, are used really at milligram levels in these insect traps to uh, uh, track the uh, male uh, diamondback moth to produce, to uh, interfere with the uh, mating cycle and reduce the, uh, the levels of the uh, insect damage to the crops. And the estimate is that maybe this is a market or that maybe at the low end might be $120 per kilogram up to maybe $2,000 per kilogram. 
And so we know a lot about fatty acid metabolism. And uh, so in my lab, uh, we've generated camelina that uh, produce high amounts of this uh, fatty acid, palmitate 16-0. So the wild type plants produce very little. The uh, engineered plants produce up to about 45% of this when we introduce this enzyme that uh, produces the palmitate. We then also have introduced a gene for the moth uh, desaturase that introduces a double bond at the 11 position. So we can make the precursor for the, uh, mo the uh, insect sex pheromone in the camelina by introducing this uh, desaturase from insects. And we have up to about 30% of the fatty acid in the form of this precursor. Okay, so then we've uh, grown these uh, lines. So we've done different types of uh, formulations and we've grown these in camelina in 2016, we uh, sent the oil, sent the seeds to uh, Sten Stemney and Alnarp, who uh, is now running a, a company called, who runs a company called Scanby Res, who uh, extracted the oil and then uh, purified the uh, precursor, the 16-1 uh, Z11. And uh, working with uh, Christopher Lofsted's lab with Hong Lee Wong, who is a chemist, he's taken the 16-1 uh, Z11 that Sten has, uh, in, um, has purified and has used synthetic chemistry to, create, to turn, convert this into the alcohol form and then into the acetate and aldehyde forms that are used for the insect sex pheromones. And uh, we're also working uh, with uh, SLU and ONARP to also introduce more genes into Camelina to uh, get closer to uh, the final product for the insect sex pheromone, including introducing a, a reductase that could take the fatty acid and convert it into the alcohol form to save one step in the synthetic uh, procedure. And so uh, Hong Lee has uh, generated basically uh, something, a formulation that's identical to the synthetic insect sex pheromone. He's also taking a less pure fraction from uh, Sten and also converted this into something that uh, somewhat resembles the insect sex pheromone uh, formulation. Okay, so this has been uh, tested in China. And so what they've done, this was just earlier this year, and uh, what they found is that they've looked at traps and looked at the uh, number of males that have been trapped. And the, uh, in these traps, the number of males that have been uh, trapped are identical to what is obtained with a synthetic mix, even using the lower uh, purity fraction. And so this uh, looks quite uh, interesting and maybe you know, this is a potentially high value mark that we can then use the camelina to produce these precursors for this. And as I told you, we're also thinking about ways to uh, uh, add value to the entire seed. So an oil seed is not just oil, about 35% of the seed weight in case of camelina is a uh, protein. And so this protein would normally be fed to, to cattle and this is one of the uh, lower value markets. And so uh, we wanna produce higher value proteins. One thing that we're working on is a uh, elastomeric protein that's probably, like, people think uh, that it's one of the stretchiest proteins in nature that uh, is uh, in the tendons of crickets and grasshoppers and provides the, uh, the flexibility that these insects have. And so we've, uh, we have the genes for this. We've silenced the, uh, the 2S uh, seed storage protein in camelina and then introduced the uh, resolin gene from the insects. We can produce uh, detectable amounts of the resolin. I don't know if they're economically viable amounts. Okay. Okay, so I, I wanna end with just telling you about, you know, that we're looking towards the future. We think, uh, you know, genetic gains have been made by tapping the diversity within a species, but we think that by applying synthetic biology and then combining this with systems biology, we can really uh, make more rapid changes in the uh, in crops and more precise uh, modifications in the crops. And if we combine this with systems biology, we can do this in a more predictable way so that uh, we know or we have a pretty good idea of what the outcomes will be from our modifications. Now with breeding, you bring in a large number of genes. You, uh, you uh, don't necessarily just bring in your target gene, but you bring in a large number of genes. It takes many years to get focused on your target gene. We think that with synthetic biology, we can make these changes in a much more rapid fashion. We've uh, used CRISPR-Cas9 uh, in Camelina to modify the oil composition. We're working uh, now to develop methods for, or to modify methods for stacking large numbers of genes so we can introduce maybe 10 genes at one time into Camelina. 
but then also combining this with the omics technologies that we have, the genomics, transcriptomics, to improve our synthetic designs. And so this is like machine learning that you make a synthetic design, you maybe get it wrong the first time, but you test it, you figure out what you did wrong. The next time around, you're more precise, and you know, after a few cycles, maybe you know exactly you know, what the issues are for producing your target compound. Okay, this is an example where we've, uh, we're trying to improve uh, camelina, both the agronomic characters and the seed uh, quality characters all in, at one time. And like I told you, that camelina, that's not been sub subjected to extensive breeding, so uh, we're trying to affect changes in seed size, heat tolerance, oil quality, oil quantity, protein quality all at one time by putting together uh, like 12 uh, or 10, 10 gene segments and trying to introduce these into camelina. We haven't finished this yet, but uh, this is where we're heading. This is an example where we have about five target genes uh, modified and we are affecting changes in the oil quality. So camelina oil is rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids that oxidize very easily which aren't desired for some industrial applications. So we've uh, modified the fatty acid composition to uh, have high monounsaturated fatty acids, which are more oxidatively stable and have generated levels of about 80% through these uh, synthetic designs. And I just want to end with, uh, recently we uh, received money in the state of Nebraska through the NSF, it's called the EPSCOR program. And uh, this is uh, centered on maize. And what we're trying to do is, uh, use systems in synthetic biology to, uh, to try to come up with new ways to uh, improve uh, maize production. And it's really looking at uh, this idea that the microbiome of the soil, you know, interacts with the roots of the plant, and maybe there are beneficial interactions with these uh, microbes that can benefit the plant. So we're looking at the natural diversity that we can find within in maize and looking at what type of exudates, what kind of chemical signals do the roots produce and whether there's variation in these signals, and can these be correlated to uh, the types of microbes that are associated with the root? And if we know this, and we know which uh, types of microbes are most beneficial, then maybe we can modify metabolism in the root to uh, produce exudates that uh, will attract the most beneficial microbes. And uh, we do this, or our idea is to do this through synthetic biology, to make these uh, synthetic designs, test them through systems biology, and iteratively improve our, our synthetic designs through this uh, continuum, iterative continuum of, uh, of uh, machine learning, if you will, to uh, produce uh, a desired outcome. Okay, so in the end, okay, so this is our dream. Okay, so we'll have uh, camelina, maybe some other oil seed, biotech oil seed crop that we produce on, on limited acreage, but is uh, engineered with very high value traits that can uh, bring additional income to the farmers to supplement what they get from uh, currently from corn and soybeans in the Midwest or from rapeseed in Sweden, and uh, have processing plants that are located in the rural areas. This is a biodiesel plant, but uh, maybe on a smaller scale, we could have uh, plants where we can do the pro uh, plant, uh, these uh, factories where we can do the processing technologies, perhaps to extract uh, precursors for insect pheromones, the astaxanthin, for the, uh, the fish feed, the resilins for uh, high value elastomeric protein markets. And uh, so we're not there, you know, we're, we're here now, and uh, hopefully someday this will be, this dream will be realized, and maybe not just in the US, maybe in Sweden, to improve your, your rural economies. Okay, thank you. <laughs>